I mean, I've been to Moldova and Kosovo and Cuba and South Africa and like all these random Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, like all these places. And and here, I think what's exciting is there's so many startups from all over the world that are here, and it's the global innovation is distributing around the world and growing, and lots of great stuff is happening, not just in San Francisco, which I really I enjoy. Welcome to another episode of Forging the Future, and I'm here today with Zach Colius of Colius Capital. He's a managing partner and a uh, VC extraordinaire, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Entrepreneur, venture capitalist, friend. Thanks for coming on the show, Zach. Yeah, thanks for having me. Fun, yeah. to, fun to be here. Fun to see uh, TechCrunch busy again. Yeah. Last year was pretty dead, so this is like the energy seems to be coming back, which I'm excited How about. many TechCrunches have you been to Disrupts? Um, Roughly. Well, I I literally was at like the very first party in Mike Arrington's backyard yard in Atherton when they had first TechCrunch was maybe six months old and they had a party and it was like everyone had come out of the caves that they had been hiding in after the nuclear war. I mean, people hadn't seen each other in years and everyone was very excited. Web 2.0 was just starting. How long ago was that? That was probably 06. Mm. Yeah. I think that I seem to I seem to remember that being 06. Um, I moved here in the fall of 05, and so yeah, I've been I've been around the block a couple times now. Well, uh, I'm happy to hear you're the one of the OGs of disrupt because everyone I've talked to so far they're saying it's their first tech crunch disrupt. Oh wow! So uh, which is mine as well actually. Oh, so okay. I think they're tapping into a new pool. Yeah. Um, how did you get invited to that backyard party? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm a hustler. My yeah. job is to get invited to things, but <laughs> I think I, an advisor to our company heard about it. And then, uh, I don't think back then you really even had to be invited. You just had to go because mm. it was a very small community back then. And everyone was excited to have as anybody that would be involved as you could be. That was before everything blew up. So it was, um, yeah, you just had to walk in the door. I, I don't remember any, any invite list whatsoever. Interesting. Yeah. And has Disrupt been a show that's been productive for you? I mean, what do you come to Disrupt for? I mean, it's a good way to see what's going on, see my friends. I've got a lot of friends here. Get a, a sense of the zeitgeist. You know, there's a there's a general sort of like ebb and flow of companies doing certain things at certain times. And it's good to see what kind of is like bubbly and especially for stuff not to invest in, because you'll see 20 AI companies all doing the same thing, and you're like, oh, well, that's gone. Mm. Um, I generally don't find a lot of like value in finding companies that I'm going to invest in on the spot, but the relationships you build are super valuable, and they, they go a long way, so, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. those collisions and networking and... Yeah, yeah. I have seen that over the last, and we've been here at second day now. Uh, it does seem to be a really great networking event. Um, both from startup side, investor side, ecosystem side, yeah. um, so client side, um, more so than a lot of shows. I, think, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the best part about the early stage tech world that this represents is everyone's trying to find the next big thing, and so that makes everyone very open and friendly, and everyone wants to help, and everyone's looking for help, and and so it creates a very sort of like generally collaborative ecosystem and community, mm -hmm. which uh, is fun. It's kind of one of my favorite things about Silicon Valley is that like, you never know who the next Mark Zuckerberg is gonna be. So it really behooves you not to be an asshole and to be helpful. And I, you know, it's, it's a fun, fun way that that culture has kind of like reinforced. Yeah, I like that give first approach. Yeah. And uh, we're both an investor and uh, tenacity is fun, Ben Nerson. Um, and uh, we actually met because you offered to give me a ride to the airport. I'm a good Uber driver. <laughs> yeah, you um, were. World I class. E I didn't even have to tip you. So, yeah, no, well, uh, as long as you give me five stars, I'm happy. <laughs> nice. But it's been great uh, getting to know you over the last year or so. Um, and you were an operator. You were an entrepreneur. That's how you started your career. Yeah. Remind me again, what, what was it uh, in the beginning? Like, what, what, it, what were you doing as an entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah, 20 years I like to joke. It's not really a joke, but I've never had a real job. I've yeah. always I've always started stuff. Um, my last company was in ad tech. So, you know, you go to a website and you look at a pair of shoes and then ads for their shoes follow you around the internet. Mm. We were one of the very early pioneers in you're, the world. In It's you? It's you're the reason that happens? And, and 
And I can make a very, I can make a strong argument for why the general view of that is just like totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like literally dumb. Um, but yeah, we we started doing that in 05 and then ended up selling the company in 2015. Why like, is it totally dumb? Um, so if you think about the internet, right? We uh, the internet we have to pay for. It costs money to build software, as you well know. Uh, servers cost money. In innovation costs money. It all costs money. And when you go on the internet right now, you open it up, it's all free. And the reason why it's free is because there are ads. And those ads, at the end of the day, they're pixels on the screen. Whether they're on your phone or on a computer, they're pixels. And so you can, you have the choice in any, in any ad. It's a very simple matrix. It's uh, the quality of the ad to brainwash you. So think about like uh, a TV commercial, 30 seconds of sight, sound, and motion. We can remember TV commercials from our childhood, you know, Bud Bowl, the 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 um, the Kool Aid Man bursting through the wall. I mean, <laughs> Oscar Mayer wieners. Yeah, exactly. Whatever. <laughs> like those 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 ideas were put in our head by sight, sound, and motion, and they're they're they'll live there for the rest of our lives. Mm. Um, whereas if you go and you look at like a Google search ad on the right hand side of Google, you know, uh, those ads they're tiny. There's no sight, sound, and motion. They don't interrupt at all, but they're incredibly relevant because you look for a new set of tires for your truck and hey, get new tires for your truck, or hey, I need a flight to here. And so the relevance drives value. And so that matrix is the ability to brainwash you times the relevance equals the value. And the funny thing is, is that like, we have to pay for the internet and we don't want to be interrupted. We don't want commercials on the internet. We don't want to like stop every five minutes and watch 30 seconds of sights out of motion. And yet people rebel against relevance. And at the end of the day, when you will get a pair of shoes and we try to show you ads for those shoes, we're just trying to make it more relevant and it actually is more relevant, makes it more valuable. And so that's more money that we can pay the publishers, which pays for a better internet and more innovation and more software development and all the good things that happen when we put more money into something that we love. And so the general public being mad about relevance is actually the stupidest thing you could ever possibly imagine. I it's, think you're the right The more relevance that. the ads are, the more useful they are to you because you'll be like, oh, I actually need that. Oh, mm. I actually want that. Oh, that's actually interesting. And the more money the publishers make, which makes a better internet. Mm. Um, so... Yeah. It's I think good, you're right about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm dead. I'm totally right about that. <laughs> Anyone who tries to argue with me about that is just either it's either I ideological actually do or... appreciate it for exactly those reasons, right? It is relevant. It's there. I'm looking for something. Oh, I didn't know about that company. Yeah. I'm gonna, I don't have to click on it. Yeah. You know, if, I, if it does interest me, I'm clicking on it. I'm not annoyed by some stupid jingle that's stuck in my head for the rest of my life. So, exactly. Um, okay, I, I, I'll take it back. I thank you for not getting all those jingles stuck in my head. Um, and so then you started your company, you had an ad tech company, you exited, and then for some reason you decided not to be an entrepreneur again. You were going to be a venture capitalist. So. Well, I, I like to think I planned it, but it was more of we sold the company and I didn't have a role going forward, which at the time was very jarring. You know, you go from being an entrepreneur and your whole life is one thing and, and suddenly you're, you don't know what to do. And uh, this is 2015. And one of uh, the companies that I had been advising was raising a Series A. And I was like, hey, uh, this, this new AngelList thing just came out. Can I try it out, this new syndicate product, uh, and try to raise some money to fill uh, like a 200K allocation in this round? And they were like, sure, go knock yourself out. So I wrote the memo and I put it up. And then like 24 hours later, I'd, I'd raised 200K. And I was like, whoa, look at that. I'm an investor now. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, it was literally just like trying to figure out what to do with my life. And then I got lucky. The next deal I did was Cruise, uh, the self-driving car company. A year later, GM bought them for a billion dollars. And then suddenly everyone thought I knew what I was doing. Genius. I'm, <laughs> I, I sort of looked like I was a genius. In yeah. reality, I was learning on the job. But, but the thing is, is that any idiot with a checkbook in the tech industry for the last decade until, you know, about a couple years ago, looked like a genius. Like literally... It was, for me, it was 50% compounding growth, IRR, every year, 50% a year, every year. It just, everything went up. Nothing died. I mean, we all look so smart. It was, like, it didn't matter what you did. Um, and so it was a great, it was a great ecosystem, a bull market like that to learn in because I got to, everything worked. And yeah, we just ride you, the wave. And you've done multiple funds now, right? So you're yeah. on which fund number now? So I've deployed about 100 million across a number of different vehicles, SPVs and syndicates and a number of smaller funds. And then uh, I have about 100 million currently uh, that I've raised in four different vehicles. I have a, my main fund, I have a rolling fund on AngelList, which anyone who wants to is welcome to join. Um, I have a syndicate on AngelList, which is like 5,000 people in there who invest whenever they want to. It's kind of like an opt-in sort of thing. 
uh, and then I also have an opportunity fund that I deploy. And you're a solo GP. Just me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So after that initial experience, I mean, and, and I guess it was like shooting fish in the barrel, apparently. But I mean, um, apparently it's resonated with investors. You've attracted a lot of capital, right? I mean, so um, and typically, like, how many LPs in a fund of yours besides um, the syndicate? I know that's yeah. A big so deal. for my for my main fund, uh, I think I have sixty LPs in that. That's thirty three million dollars. Uh, it's like an early stage vehicle. Um, and but I got lucky. I raised that in 2021, mm -hmm. and I mean, it took three weeks to raise. I mean, it was crazy how fast and easy that was. You're shaking your head. You're like, like, ah, uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not like that right now. No, it worst is. time in 10 years to raise an emerging fund. So everybody keeps telling me, you know, oh. like, oh, Chris, you would have been a billionaire if you'd done this two years ago. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't help me right now. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no. I mean, it's crazy. I have friends, great track records, great investors who are out raising right now, and it's just like. It's like pulling teeth. Mm. Um, it's really, really hard. When do you think it's going to change? Any idea? I have no idea. Just random? I mean, I, there's just so many different variables which, which are pretty pessimistic. Mm. Um, on the other hand, you know, you can, it's really easy to be pessimistic and then miss the wave and the next thing you know, everyone else is getting rich and you're sitting there looking, at, look how smart I am and how mm. wrong I am. Um, is so. it a good time to invest? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I've struggled to deploy as rapidly as I hope to this year. I wanted to move fast because I'm excited about a lot of stuff happening in AI. I'm excited about sort of just like finding great companies. And so I was I was hoping to have a big, busy year mm -hmm. and then um, have been going a lot slower than I planned. I don't know if that's just because everyone suddenly hates me and doesn't want to show me the good stuff anymore or um, if, I mean, I've seen a lot of Me Too AI companies that are just like, they're, they're pulling off of open APIs and they're doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. And I'm like, there's no business here. So maybe, maybe that's just sucked a lot of energy. I don't know. It's a good question. But yeah, I think right now the capital is sparse, which means that like you don't have to rush like you used to. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's always great entrepreneurs doing great things. Just Valuations are down, them. right? So. Valuations are down a lot. Uh, at the earliest stages, they're not down as much as they are in the later stages, mm -hmm. but they're down. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you're not looking for startups at TechCrunch Disrupt, where are you finding your startups? I look everywhere. everywhere. I mean, I just don't find them at places like this usually. Mm. Um, where I get do almost, you find them? <laughs> I get all my deals from my friends. So, my friends? Yeah, Network. Like, they, they're like, mouth. hey, I'm advising this company, or hey, I'm starting this company, or hey, I just met this company, or, mm. uh, you know, hey, my best friend is, I mean, it's usually a, hey, this is what's happening. So um, you pay attention to those kinds of um, intros, a warm intro? I mean, if someone came up to you cold, would you like? I mean, yes and no. The filter matters. Like every day I get probably 20 or 30 decks from new companies that I get over the transom. So cold, cold emails. I don't know if I've ever invested in one of those. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, over the years, I mean, that's many thousands. And I don't think I've ever found one that I like. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas... When my friends send me something, or even better, when my friends start something, the filter, for whatever reason, leads to a much higher conversion rate. Now, the question is, am I investing and paying attention because it's my friends, or am I paying attention and investing because I love the idea and I love what they're doing? And uh, it's a little bit of both, probably. Um, it's a lot easier to trust that somebody I'm going to talk to is going to be good when it comes from somebody I know who's good. Um, that's one of the, I think one of the interesting things about the way that sort of the introduction ecosystem in Silicon Valley works is that, you know, you, if you find a good company, you're doing everyone a favor if you introduce it to somebody else. Because if, if, you inter if I introduce you a great company and you invest in it, well, you owe me a favor. And so do they. And so, like, you're getting a lot of value out of that. On the other hand, if I, like, if I show you a shit company, well, you might be like, I don't know if I, that's that guy's kind of dumb. <laughs> I don't want to look at him anymore. <laughs> so... So I have an incentive to filter and make sure that I show you stuff that isn't terrible. Um, so, yeah. I, what does uh, pique your interest nowadays besides uh, the warm intro from friends? Any domains? I spend all my time in B2B software. Okay. Uh, but I'm open really to entrepreneurs showing me new stuff. Mm -hmm. like you can think about it like there's, there's established categories and, and if an entrepreneur comes to me like, okay, this category does this and I'm going to be better. Here's how I'm going to be better. I'm rarely smart enough in that space to be like, oh, they're right. Like, that's going to work. Um, 
But if an entrepreneur comes to me and they're like, hey, I'm doing this thing, it's totally new and like different and like really weird, I like that. Because then I can be like, oh, I can think about it from first principles of like, are they delivering value to customers? Is there a distribution strategy that's going to work? Is there value in there that we can eventually capture? Um, is it defensible? And, and it's not about like, you know, being the sharpest pencil in the shed, comparing all the features and functionality and go to markets and like, it's more about sort of just the general qualitative principles of building a startup, which is where I really, I gravitate towards that. Is there a particular multiple you're really aiming for other than as high as it can go, like when you have a venture fund? You know, the great thing about this business is that you really can go as high as you can go. Like my first fund, uh, I had a, like a, a fund in 2017. It's currently at 10x, and I think it's going to get to like 100x. It's crazy. Mm. It's just like, cause, but, but the- Is but it the too late people, the, for me to get into that one? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> Uh, uh, but the but the what's crazy is the multiples at the later stage you just like you you, you just like there's just so much leverage like mm -hmm. for instance in that one of the companies in there is Mercury the bank we seed invested in Mercury so I mean this is like just a rocket ship and it's a great company they have a great booth right outside here mm -hmm. um, and and there's a number of other companies in there that are similarly well positioned and growing really fast how so, old is that fund now. Not that old, six years. Six years, okay. Um, so, but on the other hand, you know, the, the LPs generally they're looking for for an early stage fund. They're looking for four to five x gross mm -hmm. is a number where they're going to be happy. But the outliers are where everybody makes all the money. Mm -hmm. You for the early stage, four to five x is great. That means you you got a good connection with the ball. But the grand slams, the hundred x. That's where everyone makes all the money. Yeah. And so it's a funny thing about venture. Everyone complains about venture. Most venture funds don't do that well, and most managers aren't that good. And yeah, that's true, because all the money gets made by the few funds and the few managers who just crush it. They, mm -hmm. For whatever reason, like Chris Sock is one of my LPs, and he, you know, with his fund, it was like at the very earliest stages, crushed it, knocked the Lower cover case off the capital, ball. yeah. I mean, yeah. just amazing. Like, what, everyone was a unicorn or something. It I don't know. It was unbelievable. I think, didn't he retire from venture after that? No, he's back. He's, like, working again. He's got Is this he? climate fund now. Okay. And he just raised another $500 million. He's, uh, like, actually working. Oh, wow, yeah, okay. they're, like... They're, I thought he was, like, hey, I did it. You know, he did I, for a little while. Yeah. And then he got bored. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the climate fund, he's got, a, he's got a great saying with his climate fund. He wants to unfuck the planet, uh, <laughs> which I respect. Yeah. I, like Chris, I mean, he's just like one of the straight shooters, and like I really respect the way he thinks. Uh, so. I'm surprised he wasn't at Venture Houston. Our whole focus was on climate tech. I'd got to get him down there. I mean, when you're a billionaire, sometimes it's like, oh, I can go to another conference or uh, I can yeah. do something more fun. Hey, now I know someone that knows him, so, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, anything that's caught your eye at the show so far? I know you've only been here a day. I mean, there's a lot of AI here, which is yeah. fun to see. Um, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to watch how it all kind of unfolds. Um, there's a lot of international startups here, which I enjoy. I, I'm, I'm part of this group of washed up entrepreneurs, and uh, they'll invite us to give talks all over the world. And I'm trying to go to every country in the world. And so, like, someone from Mongolia will be like, hey, do you want to go to Mongolia? And I'm like, yes. And so I mean, I've been doing that. And Are I'm, you keeping a list? So oh, you know, yeah, no, I'm going to everyone. Okay. I've, got, I've got the whole thing going. Uh, it's got, I'll, I'll, I'll join you at the Antarctica Venture Conference. I haven't been to that one yet, but <laughs> yeah. I would go. Yeah, I would yeah. go. But I mean, I, the, I mean, I've been to Moldova and Kosovo and Cuba and South Africa and like all these random, South, uh, Saudi Arabia, like all these places. And, and here, I think what's exciting is there's so many startups from all over the world that are here. Mm -hmm. And it's the global innovation is distributing around the world and growing. And lots of great stuff is happening, not just in San Francisco, which I really, I enjoy. I like that. Yeah. Any advice for either an investor or a startup that's coming to TechCrunch, Disrupt for the first time? I mean, my advice is always the same thing. Be helpful, do favors, build relationships, and play the long game. Okay. Like this game takes a long time. I've been doing this now for almost 20 years and the leverage that I get to enjoy now is unbelievable. But early on, it was just me running around, just being one more hustler. Well, you, you seem to be doing a good job at it and enjoying it. Do you miss being an operator or is venture for you? I, I like to say, um, it's funny, someone stole this analogy and used it word for word, but I've been saying it for over a decade now. But being an entrepreneur sort of like um, in the movie Gladiator early on in the movie, there's a scene where like Russell Crowe has been captured and him and a bunch of slaves are becoming gladiators and they're in the base of this little shitty wooden arena and there's a big hard wooden door 
and they're all terrified because they're about to get chopped in half. Imagine that. Like you're, you're like you're literally. You know you're going to go to that door, and a dude with a battle axe is going to cut you in half. Like mm-hmm. I, I can't even imagine. And like you grab whatever weapons you can grab, and like being a startup sort of like that. It's like you're going to start a company. You grab whatever weapons you can grab, whatever team you can grab, and then you get shoved down in the middle of the arena, and you fight, and you sweat, and you bleed until you die, or you exit. And most of you die. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and it's. It's a it's a rocket ship ride into the walls of your own incompetence because everything you're good at you solve quickly, everything you're bad at you plow into. So you beat one bad guy, they send two. You beat two bad guys, they send four. You beat those guys, they start shooting arrows at you and their tigers. I mean, <laughs> they get a, on chariots and yeah, they got exactly. like swinging axes. Exactly. You know? <laughs> it's, it's literally, you rise to the level of your own incompetence. Mm-hmm. So all the things you're good at, you crush. The things you're bad at are what you plow against and are super painful. Mm-hmm. And it's the hardest job in the world. And it's just a never, you could say you sleep as an entrepreneur, but you're lying. Like you're just always working through the problems that you have. Being a VC is like being a douchebag in the stands with a cold beer, betting on which entrepreneur is going to win and which one's going to die. You're like, oh, that guy's good. <laughs> yeah, and you're oh, like, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, more betting. So it's not, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't get to decide. We more, I'm like, I think, I think she's going to crush everyone. She's yeah. a bro. And that guy over there, He's uh he's gonna die. Mm. But you're betting on the winners. And then, you know, some of us used to be gladiators. We love to run out in the middle and pretend like we're still an entrepreneur. You know, help out for a little while. Oh, let me help. <laughs> oh, let's, oh no, hold on a sec. My beer's getting warm. I gotta go back. <laughs> so, I mean, it's so I, I'm I love blessed. that analogy. I, I'm I'm blessed that I get to do this job and I know I uh, you told me that uh, a couple weeks ago and I've used it a few times, so I'll I'll put trademark Zach on there for him. But uh no, I think that's an exact representation of what it's like to battle in the, the arena. Yeah, you know, it's so, so hard. Mm-hmm. It's so hard. And, but, you know, it, there's no, the great thing about the job of being an entrepreneur is that, like, it's the ultimate self-expression. It's the ultimate self-actualization. Um, it's, it's the ultimate blossoming of your own capabilities because it's just the relentless challenges are all in front of you. And then you get to solve them as best you can. Mm-hmm. And the only limiter is you. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's there's no other limiter. Because it's, you know, a lot of people will be like, well, but what if somebody gave me some capital or if somebody gave me an opportunity, which is bullshit. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's like you make things happen as the entrepreneur. You are the motive force that changes the world. And everyone else, we're along for that ride. And it's all on you. Mm-hmm. And so having been that entrepreneur for 20 years... That's a, that's a heavy load. There is a misconception of people that haven't been entrepreneurs that like, wow, if someone just gave me a million dollars, that's all I needed to make to be successful. And if that was true, yeah. uh, the world would be a lot different, right? You know, yeah. you can give a million dollars to a lot of people and it would just disappear. If you know? it was true, then most venture funds and most venture investments would make money. Exactly. In fact, they don't. Mm-hmm. You give people a million dollars and they burn that money to the ground and then they come ask, ask for more and then they burn that to the ground and, and like... It's literally like, like they say that a boat is a hole in the water you pour money into. A startup, it's a hole in the entrepreneur's mind that you pour money into. And only very rarely do they turn out to be these big things. Now, thankfully, those big things pay for everything else. And so for all of the holes in the ground that people pump money into, we have things like Uber that, you know, now we push a button and get a car. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Thank you, Travis. Um, You know, we have uh, amazing, amazing companies that make our world a better place. So. Well, like you, I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. Um, thanks for coming on and sharing some of your wisdom yeah. with our audience. Thanks and, for having me. Uh, happy to see you again, Zach. Great to we'll see you. We'll get you down too. to Texas sometime soon. I, I, I've got to get back down there. It's been yeah. too long. Yeah. I love it down there, especially with all the bullshit in San Francisco right now. Every time <laughs> I come to Texas, I'm like, ah. Come I'm, to Texas. Yeah. <laughs> happy to have you there. Thank you. Thanks, Zach.